Welcome to Documentary First, an inside look at a first time filmmaker's journey. I am your host, Josh Lindsay from the Movie Proposal Podcast. And with us is our award winning first time filmmaker, Christian Taylor. Hello there. Thank you very, very much for that, Josh. That's too kind. And uh, not only do we have one award winning filmmaker on here, we have two. And with our, as us, with us as our guest is award-winning composer Jeff Kurtnecker. Woohoo! Hello. And uh, that leaves Jason. What's up? <laughs> oh man! <laughs> you have won awards in my eyes, Jason. <laughs> well, thank you. I try. You have an award-winning laugh. Oh. And you're such a wonderful listener. <laughs> 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 You're an active, good listener. <laughs> I try. Josh, you are an amazing announcer. Oh, thank you. Host. Thank you. Actually, you may not know this, but I too am an award-winning filmmaker. Is I did not know that. Tell us what award you won. In, in, in college at Truman State University at their first annual film festival, I entered my film, The Adventures of Peter Rabbit, and... Uh, my lead actress, Sauerkraut, won Best Actress. That's exciting. Now I want to see that film, Josh. And I actually won Best Comedy when I was in college for a film that I produced at the Aurora Borealis Film Festival at Aurora University. So we're so, all... Oh, wow, look at this. Technically, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but so exciting. Let's be honest. The legitimate award yeah, yeah. are Jeff and Christian. Okay, so... For uh, now. For now. Before we talk about that, Christian. Yes. Get a film update. Yeah. So as usual, there's been a lot happening over the course of the last week. Um, number one, I took a vacation, which doesn't often happen. But my husband took me to the woods of upstate Wisconsin, and I was at Lake, um, well, it's actually Lake Cordere, which is a French name, which means short ears. So the French explorers named this lake for the Indians who cut off their earlobes. Just a little bit of history for you. My gosh. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, Lake Cordere. I was there this weekend. That was super nice. It revived my soul, and it helped me deal with the rejections we received this week. Um, we received rejections from the Paris Art and Movie Awards, which was heartbreaking. Now that means that we've been rejected by two two French film festivals. We also were rejected this week by the Chicago International Film Festival equally. Almost a little more so heartbreaking. I have to say I was a little mad about that one. Um, but what I did learn in both of those cases, as, as we have discovered before, they usually accept high numbers of uh, films and this year they were significantly reduced. So, for example, the Chicago Film Festival used accepts around 150 films. This year they took somewhere between 50 and 60. So, our chances for being accepted are just incredibly small. And most of them are choosing films with stars or with controversial topics dealing with racial justice or with politics or with you know, health and science and climate, things like that, or, or racial inequality. I mean, um, you know, usually uh, LGBTQ issues that are sort of hot button issues right now. Usually those very controversial, provocative films are the ones that are being selected, particularly if they have stars in them. So we kind of had no chance when you take down the numbers all the way to, you know, more than half. So that kind of stung. And then yesterday we were supposed to hear back from the Mint Film Festival, which is in Montana, Billings, Montana. And we heard nothing at all. Nothing. And there's been no communication that the festival was canceled. And I even wrote them to say, hey, did I miss an announcement? We were supposed to hear today. I didn't hear anything. Didn't get a response to my email. But I do think maybe this is par for the course as well, where film festivals just don't have anything to share, so they don't, which is frustrating given that we paid money to these film festivals. You feel like they should owe you some sort of explanation or communication. And so that's very how, how long? How long has it been since the due date? Well, I, the due date for the Mint Film Festival was yesterday. It was just yesterday. Okay. 
So, I mean, it hasn't been too terribly long. My, my guess is, I mean, anytime something de- hap- doesn't happen the way you want it to, the answer is always COVID right. these days, right? So, you know, I'd say give it a week or two and you'll hear something. Well, and, but I mean, you know, we submitted to this film festival on March 1st. They were supposed to let us know yesterday. And the film festival is September 17th, you know, a little, slightly a little more than a month away. And you would think they have to have a plan in place. I mean, it's not like this film festival is in December. You know, it's really frustrating. I, I think your expectations are too high. <laughs> you're, you're dealing with people who are, are living in a, in a pandemic, being affected in significant ways or in small ways, but they're being affected. And, uh, and these are mostly artists you're probably dealing with. And so organization may not be at the top of their list. And uh, I, I'm not surprised that they haven't got back to you yet, quite honestly. I'm surprised no. that the other film festivals have gotten back to you. I should be thankful instead of complaining. Is that what you're saying, Josh? Take perspective. Just shift your perspective and you'll feel better. Okay. Sounds good. Well, guess what, though? Today, we're here to talk about the good news. And so I am here to present an award. Uh, One of the things that happened this week is that we received the laurels for the film festivals we were selected to. So that was super exciting. And uh, I would like to show you uh, well, Jeff, I would like to present this award to you. Congratulations for winning the best original score for a documentary for the International Sound and Film Music Film Festival. Woo! Oh, thank you, Laurel, Jeff. Thank you. If you're That's listening, awesome. uh, eventually this will be everywhere. It will be on our website. It will be on social media. It will be on uh, our film poster. But right now we just received these hot off the presses. And so, uh, Jeff, you'll be able now to put this on your own website because you are now an award-winning composer. Uh, and this film festival is not too shabby a film festival. It's pretty pretty good. And we want to hear a little bit more about that. So we brought you on to give you this award. Also, I would love to hear, as the composer, what the experience has been like for you. Tell us uh, why we initially chose this film festival and then what our journey has been like with this film festival. Also, tell us a little bit about where it is. Where in the world it is? Yeah. I'm sure I understand. Siri does not understand. Well, I wasn't oh. asking you, Siri. <laughs> well, it's it's in Croatia. Um, and How in Croatia? Yeah, and so I hear it's beautiful there. I've never been to Croatia, um, but it seems like a beautiful place. And um, I think the festival's been running about like eight years or so. Mm-hmm. And um, and so Christian, when we were submitting, when she was looking at submitting for film festivals, she wanted. Um, you know, I benefit from this, that she wanted to find film festivals that had a focus on, on music because she really believed a lot in the score for the film. And so um, she was submitting, she had a list of some, and I had asked a friend of mine um, who is pretty well known in the film, the film music world. And he had actually recommended um, the Ghent Film Festival, which was already on Christian's list. And he was actually on the board um, at one point of this film festival uh, in Croatia. And so um, Christian submitted to it. And um, when she told me that we, uh, we were accepted, right? Like it was like a. Officially selected. So that's the first stage. Yes. You are an official selection. We have a world for that as well. So we were officially selected to compete in this film festival. So I was actually, I, I, this is, this whole film festival is new to me. Um, just the world of it. So when she said we were selected, I thought that meant we were selected. I, I equated that with nomination already. And so for some reason, I was like, oh, that's awesome. That's great. And then when they rolled out the nominees, I was talking to Christian, like m- very matter of factly about it. And I said, oh, it's, you know, the nomination. And she goes, wait, we were nominated. And I was like, yeah, is this, is this not, is this news to you? Because I feel like you're the one who told me. And she goes, no, 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 no. We were selected to be part of the film festival, right? That's a long list. And then there's a short list of nominees and even the shorter list of winners. And so 
then I was like, oh my gosh, we actually like, we made a cut, right, from being in the festival to now being on the short list of nominees. And um, so I wasn't excited at first because I thought, oh, this is something that I had already known for a long time. And then Christian clarified for me. And it was and funny I, because that day, after we were officially selected, like for me, that was a huge deal. That was only the second film festival we had ever been selected to be in. So that was a huge deal. And that's why I was so excited when I said, hey, we've been selected. And then I knew the day the nominations were coming out. So I was refreshing my page like constantly to see if we were nominated. And I thought, there's no way. Because the other films on there were Parasite, were American Factory, which is Michelle and Barack Obama's first big documentary. And I was like, there's just no way we're going to be nominated for anything. So I was checking and checking and checking. And then all of a sudden... Jeff sends me a text about something and he had it circled that we were nominees. I'm like, no way. I couldn't believe it. And he's like, wait a second, that's news. I'm like, yes, that's a big deal. Uh, but then we both were like, yeah, but there's no way we're winning. We're just not winning because look at what our competition is. We should just be so thankful that we were selected. So you try to be like cool about it and you try to accept the defeat before it even happens just to set your expectations. But even when they told us they were going to announce the winners, I just kept, I was waking up in the middle of the night, checking my phone because they're seven hours ahead of us. I wanted to beat Jeff to the punch and find out. <laughs> and she did actually, but I, I'm, I was the same way. I really didn't think about it much when we were selected. I was like, Oh, that's great. I didn't really think about it a whole lot. But then when Christian clarified that the nomination is like a big deal, then I didn't, I didn't realize how badly <laughs> I wanted to find out if I had won until I was nominated. And then I was the same. I was just like refreshing the whole day on the, on the award announcement day um, just to see if we had won. And then of course they delayed their announcement by like 12 hours or something. And so um, it was just sort of frustrating. I was up till two in the morning, our time just refreshing, refreshing. And um, it was it was illuminating how badly I didn't realize I wanted it that bad. And I guess I did, you know, just a little bit of backstory is that in November of 2018, I had been on staff at a, a video game company as a composer and an audio director. And I had been there for 10 years from 2000, fall of 2008 to the fall of 2018. And our company had got closed down um, by our parent company. And so they, they said they didn't want to. Uh, us to make any more games and so we shut down and that kind of kicked me off a cliff of like well now what do I, I do I guess I try to find another composer job but those are uh, you know those just don't really exist anymore um, as much as they used to on staff at companies or I could try to go into business for myself and and do the freelance thing and so I thought I'll take the severance pay and 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 do that and so I'd had, I have a lot of relationships in the video game world. So I tried as a composer to, to work those contacts and see if I could work for people. And it just was such a slow start. And uh, I mean, it still is actually, but it's been almost two years, you know, about 20 months of just trudging through this and feeling like I'm, I'm feel like I'm not getting anywhere. And, and I actually don't even know if I'm supposed to be on this path. Like there wasn't a whole lot of validation. There was just obstacle after obstacle. And then COVID hit. And I'm like, you know, we're burning through our savings trying to make this freelance thing work. And I'm not even sure if I should be doing this as a composer. Maybe I should, you know, be a welder or a plumber or something else. So um, it's been a very trying, you know, 20 months of trying to figure out, is this the path I should be on as a composer? And, and Christian has always said, yes, this is the path you should be on as a composer. Yeah. Christian's course, words don't pay the bills, however. <laughs> uh, but his wife has also believed in him very ardently, and she's been so incredibly supportive. Yay, Jenna, uh, for being like, uh, she's believed in him, that this is what he was created to do. And I saw the same thing, that this is an incredible gifting, and he just needed a chance, and he needs people to be able to see his work. And that's why I, I was, it was so important for me to, uh, you know, submit to film festivals where he could have some public recognition. It just breaks my heart. You know, one of the incredibly sad things about this COVID situation is that, yes, the award is exciting, but um, it's, it would have been super awesome to be there in person. 
You know, oh, yeah. if, if we would have gone, it's this beautiful place on the Mediterranean where all these Roman ruins are. And in the midst of this with other composers that he could have met and interacted with, um, we missed out on all of that. Um, I asked them if they would send the award and they said, oh, well, we'd really love for you to come here so we could present it to you. And I woke up this morning, Jeff, I have to tell you, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to start planning my trip for Croatia next year. I don't want them to send the award. I, I think we should go there and get it. Yeah. I, Jenna feels the same way. So we've been, we've been, I sent you that text, you know, just keep us, keep us informed if they're, if they're letting you know about dates or offers or how to get out there. Um, I think it'd be a lot of fun and just a way to, to mark the occasion because for the first time in my life, I can say I'm an award-winning composer. I've never been able to say that before. And I've done a lot of things and a lot of projects that have never really gotten much attention, but I've poured my heart and soul into them and they just kind of like fizzle. Um, and so to have this sort of recognition was really the first validation I've had in such a long time that, okay, maybe, maybe I should be doing this. Maybe I have what it takes to kind of keep going. And, um, and so that was just a huge, a huge win for me personally and emotionally. Um, to sort of, I, I can withstand more uncertainty in my life now, knowing that, I mean, not a whole lot more, but a little bit more, uh, knowing that uh, that I have this kind of validation behind me. It really, um, it really was a, a huge deal. I, my kids were so sick of, I, I was, that whole day I found out that we won. I was the award winning everything that day. Uh, I was the award winning dad making pancakes and the award winning, <laughs> my kids were like, stop but i did i stopped the next day but for 24 hours i was the award winner <laughs> yeah i think my family's pretty sick of it too you know we also won the best feature documentary award at the indie central states indie fan film fest and that was a big deal because we were originally selected for the spring division whatever that meant and so then they have to pick an overall for the entire film festival. And then we did win that. And so that did just happen this weekend where we were the overall winner for the whole film festival in the documentary category. Well, that's a big deal, but nobody really understands that, you know, distinction or really cares any more than I do. Um, in my mind, I was saying that same thing. This is Christian Taylor, the award-winning yeah, documentary that's... filmmaker, making her breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it, <laughs> there is that validation, especially when you, you you put your heart and soul on the line, and you just don't know what this child is going to grow up and do. Right? You, we've Christian and, and the team has given birth to this this film, and um, you just don't know what's going to happen or how it's going to be received. And we know that people who already have a a heart towards World War II are probably excited about it, but how does it impact just the general person who is, is watching the film for the first time? So it's, it's such a validation when Christian gets that news uh, about that it's been selected and then nominated and all these things. It's, it's, a, it's an emotional journey and then that validation. Um, but in, in this particular case, when we saw the nominees, like Christian said, we were, I had texted her and I said, well, you know, I, I, really want this badly, but obviously it's not going to happen. And I was kind of hoping she would text back and go, Oh no, no, no. We have a great shot. But she was like, yeah, yeah obviously the odds are stacked against us. And I was like, Oh, you know, <laughs> you know? Uh, but I mean, that's, we both felt the same way. Um, I think we probably were both looking for some, someone to pull us up. Um, but we both realized like, look, it, we're up against this Apollo 11, documentary that the guy had already won a bunch of awards for his score. Um, the American factory was, I think the Oscar winner for best documentary. And that guy had won a bunch of awards and great reviews for his score. So we thought, well, it was fun to be nominated. And then we hang up the, but, <laughs> uh, we woke up, she texted me. I think it happened like five thirty our time in California. And, um, so she had texted me and I woke up and I looked at my phone and I was like, Oh my gosh, it's crazy. And so I called her and then my wife found out. And so we were, uh, we were celebrating, but that night Jenna and I had watched American factory or we did watch American factory on Netflix just to find out, okay, well, this is the other film that was that won alongside the girl who wore freedom. Let's check that out. And 
and see what that music is like. Because the interesting, interesting thing is um, the Girls War Freedom score is purely synthetic. I have no, there's no budget. As much as we really wanted to, Christian wanted that experience of an orchestra, you know, playing with the film in the background and, and, see, and hearing that come to life. Um, we just didn't have the budget for it. So it's entirely synthetic, um, which in my mind, it's, I think that's tough to compete against full-on Hollywood scores that have the live instrumentation and the live musicians um, that really bring it to life in a different way. So um, when we start, Jenna and I started watching American Factory and I was listening to the score in like five minutes in, I thought, how is this possible? This guy, like the music for that film is really well done. And the fact that they thought we were on the same level to give us both the award, I thought was that to me even sort of made it even more meaningful to hear what we were on par with. And I think, you know, to your point, Jeff, what they're judging is the score. They're not judging the instrumentation of the score. You know, they're judging the creative mind behind the music. Yeah. And I, I, that's what, that, that's where I think your genius lies. Had we had the budget, we would have gone into a studio oh, sure. would have done that and it would have sounded the same as impressive. Um, it's just that we didn't have the budget and thankfully they were able to look beyond that. Yeah. I know, it's, you know, some people have a real hard time hearing if they hear the brass sounds a little synthetic or cheesy, it really takes the air out of the balloons for them. And fortunately this film festival, whether they paid attention to the synthetic or not. They, they heard past it and they were able to, to sort of critique it appropriately. And I thought that was awesome. Yeah. So um, do you guys have any questions at this moment? Yeah. So you, you've won the award. Um, is there, is there prize money with this? Would you get $10,000? Yeah. Yes. I think right. Christian is it 10,000. <laughs> is that what it was? I wish I could say that was true. <laughs> there is a crystal pine statuette. Okay. Uh, which I did, you know, ask them to send. And they're like, well, we're hoping you'll come here next year and pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I mean, I think that I think we should choose that option. Go and pick it up and have a lovely week in Croatia. That sounds amazing. So you'll be able to celebrate in the future and, and actually get the, well, I'll call it trophy. So that that's cool. Um, and then how will you use this i mean this seems like an opportunity to market the film yes i mean yes. great I mean, question. do other film festivals who have not picked you guys yet now can they see this on the radar and go oh it's an yes. award winning so in film freeway you can list what awards you've won <laughs> what other film festivals you've been in um and we will list that there so other film festivals will see we've won awards um sometimes that's not in your favor joe blow film festival and you know podunk nowhere um you know everybody's gonna be like well you know gosh i don't know that we want them in our film festival it could backfire on you that way uh this film festival in the music world in the score world is well respected as jeff said so we will put that on there and we will list our award and um maybe that will help us maybe it won't but the other ways we'll use it um our publicist has been putting together um you know this um, re release document, sort of a press release to send out to the trade papers about our film. And we've been timing that till we can announce our Chagrin Documentary Film Festival selection. So uh, we are now officially able to say we were selected for the Chagrin Documentary Film Festival in Chagrin Falls, Ohio. That is between October 6th and October 11th. And that is the biggest film festival we've been accepted into so far. Uh, it's a well-respected documentary film festival. It's been around about 11 years. And um, they're really taking this seriously. They're hoping to do an in, a hybrid so that part of it is in uh, Chagrin Falls, maybe at drive-in theaters or outdoor theaters, and then others of it are virtual. Uh, where only the people in Ohio are able to watch the film. But if you're in Ohio and you're able to hear this, uh, you can watch The Girl Who Wore Freedom at the Chagrin Falls Doc Fest virtually. 
And so we have a big press um, push planned to, you know, tout our film right around that time. So uh, they're going to put out a plus press release, I think, next week that announces all of their selections and we'll send it to all the trade papers. And then we will piggyback on that. And in that we will list our laurels and we will list our awards and stuff like that. We will put these on our movie poster. We will put these on our website. And so we'll start using these um, in that way. Is this, I mean, I got to imagine winning awards has got to help in some way with a potential distribution deal. I mean, oh, yeah. and, right? Uh, the distribution company that we're talking about absolutely is interested in us continuing this film festival journey for this exact reason. Because uh, so we, they've told us if we sign this deal with this distribution company, they've told us that we can continue to stay in these film festivals until our release date. So if we sign with this company, our release date is next June, like D-Day next year. So we would stay in all the film festivals we have submitted to if we get in and if we win the awards, that's accolades that they can then put on their DVD covers, you know, and sell to different, they will use that in, in pitching our product to the networks and cable channels and streaming services uh, so that we, they can make our sale. So we've got Jeff on the call here. He wrote the score. Um, I think we had a lot of fun, but not enough time last time to listen to some music and, and play around with that. So can we do that again? Can we hear some of the score and talk about the process and so forth? Yeah, we can. You know, uh, Christian and I, we've been working on this film as director composer for, you know, two years. I guess it's now done, so we're not continuing to work on it. But... Um, is it really done? Is it ever done? I, I don't know, actually. actually uh, I was reading the uh, distribution agreement. I'm really digging in there trying to understand it. It does say in there that we may have to do further edits. Oh, okay. Great. Well, <laughs> my price, my as an award-winning composer, I'm telling everyone my price is doubled. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, so, yeah, you know, it's... Um, it's a collaborative effort uh, for sure. You know, I was thinking um, it's sort of like uh, I'm watching the last dance right now about Michael Jordan and the bulls and everything like that. And um, it, this whole process has really made me realize like when you're a coach of a team with a lot of talent, like Christian's responsibility is to get her team that brings talent to the table. Well, she has to get us all working together and pulling the same direction um, to go out and deliver the best possible quality that we can. And so, you know, she not only is the vision keeper for the film, but she also has to wrangle everyone's talents and get us all pulling in the same direction, which is no easy task, especially when you're dealing with creative types who, um, who want you know, to quit when they get some notes. Yeah. I mean, that doesn't seem realistic, but maybe let's just say if that happened, uh, <laughs> someone would quit. <laughs> uh, but uh, I mean, so I think let's just pause for one second. For those of you that don't know this, Jeff did try to quit on me. And I just want to say, I am so glad I did not let you quit. Can you imagine? I, I wouldn't have a laurel or an award or a crystal pine or anything. I'm so glad we have that experience behind us. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, it, was a, it was a rough patch, you know? I, what can I say? I was trying to get my, my act together. Um, composers listen you want an emotional composer you want an emotional composer who is ready to quit if they don't feel like you like them i because jeff honestly i think that's what makes you great well maybe i don't know i think i had a, a friend of mine someone i really admired in my life who who we were ha we'd have coffee all the time because we were co-workers and he would always tell me um that all that you know, the frustration and the anger and the hope and the sorrow, like all those emotions that I would, you know, be spewing off all the time. He's like, all that makes this creative engine that really drives the music I was writing at the time. And then I think you, you carry that forward. Not that you want to live in misery in order for your art's sake, although I think there probably are some artists who do that. Um, but <clears throat> yeah, I think the way people feel the world or interpret things 
um, definitely comes out in a creative, in a creative filter. And so, yeah, I remember I texted, uh, I texted Christian and I said, I'm so sorry for being a, a moody composer. And she's like, that's exactly what I want. I want you to be a moody composer. So she gives me the freedom to be moody. And I try to take feedback in the way it's in the spirit it's intended, not as a criticism on me. Um, you know, she's not saying, uh, man, Jeff, I wish you had more hair. She's saying, I don't really feel the same way you feel when, when I hear this. And so what we're going to go through is a good example of, of that, of, of me going like, she says, I don't want this. I feel like I delivered this. And she goes, well, I don't, I, I don't really feel the same way you feel about this piece of music. And then we have to sand it down and get it to what it needs to be. So, um, one of the things that came to mind was um, Danny's theme from from the film. We hear it in the film a few times throughout, um, but when working on what that theme should be, I'm going to play you what I submitted first, and then I'm going to play you what we ended up with in the film, and and we can talk a little bit how, a little bit about how that process happened and how we went from something over here to something over here. So this is what uh, I'm going to play it here, even though you can you guys hear that. I want you to okay. play it all the way through. Okay. So this is what I submitted originally. And she said, you know, I, I was over there when they were shooting the principal photography and I had met Danny and I had heard the story and I had walked the ground where she was standing and all that stuff. So I had a little bit of background. I wasn't just imagining it. And then, um, you know, a lot of the story was from her childhood memory and we're, we're pulling that out. And so we both agreed that something childlike and sort of this awe and wonder would be appropriate. Okay. So this is what I submitted first for childlike beauty, wonder, right? Here we go. Are you telling me Christian didn't like that? Yeah, I know. It wasn't good enough for her, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> that is not so, what I said. No, no, no. Um, that's not a bad piece of music, right? Even when I was revisiting it, um, I thought, oh, yeah, I remember that. I, like, I still do like that as a piece of music. So the conversation that ensues after I deliver that to her is not on the merits of, is this a good or bad piece of music, right? I think in the moment, as something that I just sort of written and given it to her, I'm open to those wounds to feel like, oh, she's saying she's making a categorically claim that this is a bad piece of music. And that's not really, it, that conversation could happen. That's not what she was saying. She was saying, <clears throat> I don't feel the same way about this that you feel about it. I'm not arguing that merit if it's good or bad. I'm just saying you want me to feel a certain way and I'm not feeling it. Now, there's, there's a disconnect. In all fairness, <laughs> That is not how I began talking with Jeff. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> uh, I had no idea how to talk to a composer. And I think that is key. Um, and we've talked about this before in the podcast, but as first time filmmaker, if you're listening to this, I think it's important to understand I initially didn't have the words. I didn't know what to say. Sometimes I didn't necessarily like the instrument I was hearing. I didn't like if it went up or down. I didn't like how it made me feel, but I didn't quite know what to say about that. And you do worry, gosh, if I say I don't like this, am I going to hurt his feelings? And then if I don't like it, what do I tell him I want? I mean, I struggled with all of those things. And so we fumbled in the beginning, trying to figure out, first of all, how to talk to each other in a way that he wouldn't be offended or in a way that I could articulate what I wanted in a meaningful way that Jeff could implement in sound. It's very difficult. 
Yeah, I mean, because we worked off the assumption of childlike, kind of childlike um, dream, wonder, that kind of feeling. <clears throat> Excuse me. And what I just played, I, I felt like as a composer, I feel like that that is in that path of childlike, you know, it's, it's a lullaby in a way. Um, and it has those endearing qualities, which I thought, yeah, we're on the right path. But the thing is a childlike wonder is a wide spectrum. And so um, that may sound like something you might hear over a crib, you know, um, uh, or in a music box or something that would work well over a montage of, of a mom putting their newborn baby in the, in the crib. Um, that something like that might work really well for that. But what Christian wasn't getting was this sense of, of this memory that was kind of complex and there's good things and there's bad things about this memory. And it, it's, it's it was missing the gravitas, you know, sort of there's a heavy element of what was going on, I think at that time. Yeah. And so she, she just kept saying, I want it simpler. I want it simpler. That, that piece I just played kind of keeps running. There's a current and it keeps going and going. And she just, she wanted simple. She wanted poignant, but still childlike, but more, the wonder is not in the notes. The wonder is going to be in the space between the notes. Again, this is not the conversation we had. This is, you know, looking back on it years later and trying to interpret what we were each trying to say to each other. But I do remember specifically, she's like, I just want it to be simpler. I want it to be something that is not simplistic, but something that is uh, just a little more poignant in its, in its simplicity. And so um, we ended on, on this. After some trial and error, I was trying to figure out something that just felt like what she was saying. And here's where we ended up. So this is actually what made it in the film for Danny's theme. And again, it, it encompasses the simplicity that Christian's looking for. It encompasses um, the, the gravity of, you know, of the memory and the moment that Danny was going through and it yet still being childlike and beautiful. And so here's where we landed. So still childlike, but very different in terms of what you feel emotionally. And that's where there's a million different flavors of ketchup out there. And that's what we're trying to figure out is what, what are we doing? We want the same thing. We just got to try to figure out what the nuance is. And so, um, and the breakthrough, the breakthrough is exactly what he just talked about. The breakthrough in communication came when I realized the way to speak to Jeff was an emotion. This is what I want to feel in this moment. It's just as simple as that. And once I began to talk to Jeff in feelings, I want this, I want to feel afraid and on edge here. I want to feel warm and happy here. I want to feel triumphant here. Um, we begin to speak each other's language. It was very interesting. It was not too dissimilar than learning how to speak with my French friends. You know? Yeah, yeah, it, it's a it's a fascinating piece of the puzzle. But um, you know, she's saying I want. She would say, I want childlike, you know, music, and I'm like, well, that's what I just gave you. But she's like, no, 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 it's not. It's not quite what I'm looking for. And then we have to figure out what it is. Where is that disconnect? And that for me was a huge learning experience as well. Her saying, I want this. I feel like I just gave you that. And she goes, no, 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 this isn't. And that hap that's happened many times throughout, you know, almost every time I write a piece of music, I think, oh, I nailed it, right? I, that's pirate music if I ever heard it. And they come back and they go, this sounds nothing like what I thought I told you to write. And it happens all the time. And so it's just a matter of figuring out, well, what did you mean when you said pirate music or childlike wonder or anything like that. So um, I think that's part of the composer's job. Christian's setting a vision and a tone. She's like, I want, 
I want to feel this here and I want the audience to feel this at the scene. And I go, oh, okay. And I write something and she goes, yeah, but I'm not feeling what I told you I want to feel. And now I got to figure out, well, why is that and how do we fix it? And, and I would be remiss if I did not say that Bill Ebel was equally involved in this pro- process as an editor. Um, there were many times where I would, before we ever gave notes to Jeff, Bill and I would come together and talk about how do you feel about this? Well, I feel this way. How do you feel about this? And, and most of the time, Bill and I were aligned. But there were times where I would say, well, I kind of disagree. I think this. And, and Bill would say, you know, I would like to hear this here. And I was like, oh, I didn't think about that. So there was a lot of talking between Bill and I after Jeff would deliver music. We would get on the same page about what we wanted. We would, and then we would try to figure out how to communicate that to Jeff. Um, so it really was a, a team effort. Um, and even Jason at the end, Jason is in charge of our sound. He's been on before. Jason then had to work with the score in balancing the way that it sounds with the VO and had to work with Jeff to make sure that when Jason was fixing the sound levels, he didn't lose some of the aspects of the dynamics of the sound that Jeff wanted in the score. So it was a real team effort to get to what the International Sound and Film Music Festival people actually heard. Um, And I think our team worked so well that way together. we got into a real groove of learning how to talk with each other and work with each other and trust each other to deliver the final product. So I actually have a question if that's, if that's cool. I know I'm, I'm usually not allowed to ask them, but I was wondering. (laughs) I'll I'll allow it. (laughs) So Jeff, Christian gives you an emotion, a feeling, what she wants to feel. Mm -hmm what is your process of taking what she asked you to, to give and then turn it into music? How, what, what is that process like for you? How do you do that? Is Big it just time. something that happens or do you like, this is step one, step two, step three. I don't know. What's if that like? a step. Uh, it's probably not a logical process and it's probably different for every composer. Um, but it is, it's a language, you know, um, it's like if I asked you to translate something from, you know, from English to Latin, if you knew Latin, you would then take a minute and try to rework it and and translate it. So I feel like my job as a composer is to translate, you know, story and emotion into musical language. So usually the first thing I do is sit down in front of a piano and find a chord or a note, something that starts to speak to me that makes me feel in, you know, like that emotion. And so um, when she says childlike wonder, I'll go back to that first example. Um, When she said childlike wonder or childlike, you know, just memory, um, I remember just wanting it to feel um, like flowing because in my mind, I'm still thinking like this lullaby. And so um, I started just just kind of plunking around notes and finding, uh, I like that chord, it's A major, and then I like that. Uh, no. And then I landed on that big drop down, I remember, and I was like, oh, I love that. Now I love those kind of things in music anyways. Like I love those big leaps down. So for me, I kind of landed on an opening phrase and I was like, oh, uh, that's, that seems fragile and tender to me. And it seems humble. Like those leaps down to me feel like you're willing to, you know, put your hand in the hand of a child and lead them on. Like there's a humility there. So I started working with that melody and seeing where it wanted to go. And um, at that point, it's sort of like following a thread. If you imagine like a big ball of yarn, uh, that's all my musical choices. And then I have this little thread of a melody I found and I just kind of keep pulling at it. it. Only that big ball is like in my soul and this little yarn is coming out of my heart. <laughs> and so I'm pulling at it 
and I'm trying to figure out where is this going to go. And <clears throat> uh, I firmly believe that as you start to play music, as you compose it, that it has, it starts to take on a life of its own. And that's been my experience is that as I play, I'm like, man, that note really wants to go to this note. Oh, and then I see this harmony wants to go here. And so I'm trying to write it and not, not trying to strangle it. I'm trying to see where it wants to go. And there's a lot of failure in that, playing with the melody and going, ah, oh, it's not quite right, but it's close. So I always start there. I start with just getting a little fragment of it and then seeing where it wants to go. And as I pull in that thread, I've had many times where I pull that thread all the way out and I go, man, this is unbelievable. And then it's awful, right? At the very end you go, this is horrible. And then that was not the, that was not the right thread to be pulling on this whole time. But um, wow. that's at least how it starts for me. And um, I don't think of keys right away, you know? Um, I don't think of key centers or scales right away, but um, there are certain chords that make me feel a certain way. Um, and so like, when we got to the, do go the tension one. So remember I there, I said to you, I need this to with the Michelle de Valivier when he was shot. I said I oh, oh. It to be more on edge. Yeah. Well, that so interesting that we ended up um, just landing on this one note. I think we talked about this in a previous one. This kind of one note, these pizzicato strings that would drill. And then we surrounded that with these other chords like, You know, these other strings and these harp would kind of flow around it. Um, and that's just knowing where the half steps are and what, what creates tension around that drone of that one note that's giving you this suspense. Um, but what with Danny's theme, what, what made it into the film, um, you talk about where to start. Like I knew what, after talking to Christian a few times about the theme and what she was hoping to get out of it, I knew it couldn't be so simple as, right? Now, the first one I played was not that, but at its essence, it was a little bit of that. If I were to distill it down, it was a little bit of simplicity. So what I knew I had to make the chords a little bit more colored. And so we, and we start on a, a major chord that is not in root position. It's what they call first inversion. So the third of the chord is in the bottom, which automatically starts you off with this kind of like, hmm, interesting. It's not, not what you would expect. And then there's a, there's a clash there. And that note is not in the chord. So I started creating something beautiful, but that was kind of, it was beautiful, but it was also not- Predictable. Pre predictable or prescribed exactly how something childlike might be. And then we have this, these kind of notes in there and it all starts to melt together to make, you know, kind of this, Ooh, it's a fancy chocolate, you know, rather than just your Hershey milk chocolate, I'm giving you a little something that, you know, we're at the dove chocolate level. Now we've added a little, we've ste <laughs> you stepped it up. Um, and so when she does, when Christian says something like, I really want more of this, I want more suspense or I want, then I know to turn up the heat on some of these different chords and tones that usually are just for color, but now I need to lean into those heavily to pull out more of the suspense, the mystery, the, you know, the whatever she wants. So, um, and that's just knowing the language of music. That's just some of that's personal preference of things of how much back to the future inspired me as a kid. But some of that is, <laughs> is just using the language of scales and music, to pull out those nuances, much like a chef would say, I know what this needs, oregano. Doink, doink, doink. It's, and then it's amazing. So that's what I feel like I'm doing, is pulling a thread of Dove chocolate with oregano. I mean, that's... <laughs> you gotta make this into an animal. I'm telling you what. <laughs> From the ball of string to the oregano, this is... Yeah, I don't know. I, guess I, <laughs> no, I overload on the analogies. <laughs> It's fascinating, you know, Jeff. It's yeah, kind of it's like amazing. what I envision is like you sit down, and it's sort of like the spirit takes over your fingers, and you're like, "Where's it gonna go?" Yeah, in some ways, sometimes I black out. I don't know what I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> you have some basic ideas, and then you're just hoping that your fingers will find it. Yeah, there's a, there's a there's an inner ear or like an inner voice that, you know, it's much like writing. If you were writing something, a book or a speech or anything, um, where does the sentence want to go? 
until you're using your words and you know your intuition is telling you, I want to make a point with this sentence and I want to really hammer it home. So I'm going to use some stronger language. I'm going to use decisive words. Um, and musically, it's the same way. Like I really want to, I want us to convey this. So I'm going to use these tones. My inner ear is kind of telling me and leading me, but, um, but I'm trying to figure out what the combination is, right? And what, just like with the words, where should this, maybe this word should go here and this adjective should be over here. I'm doing that with music. I'm trying to figure out how the combination of these tones and chords is going to convey that in the best possible way. And, you know, there's a lot of iteration in that. I'll write it. I'll put it on my phone. I'll go for a walk. I'll listen to it on my phone as I walk and go, okay, that does after 20 times hearing it, I don't like it anymore or, oh, I really like this part more than I did. So it's just a lot of soul searching. Um, you know, a lot of naps involved. Um, you got to take naps. No, I actually, <laughs> I wish, I wish there were naps involved. No, you do have to sleep on things sometimes. And Absolutely. I think that's a, that's a healthy thing. Yeah. I, I think it's great, Jeff, that you ventured into the depths of your creative process because it really is so enlightening to those of us who don't speak your language to hear how the process actually happens. It's kind of just as messy for you as it is for us. And yeah, absolutely. Kind of good to learn. Yep. You know, listening to all this has been very insightful because it, it actually, it, it's actually scared me a little bit. Like, like we get to see a bigger picture of like, this could have been a disaster <laughs> and because you guys didn't know each other. I mean, I mean, you're not, you're not, you weren't, an award-winning composer prior to this, right? Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I think about, I get a little nervous sometimes thinking about my kids and who they're going to marry one day and I hope they find the right partner, you know, and, and uh, I mean, this, this is kind of what this is, like a marriage. It's like, you know, Christian's got this idea and this vision and, and she's got to find someone that's going to like, not only have the talent and the experience, but be able to communicate together because it could just end in a big, ugly divorce. Sure. And, uh, and thankfully it didn't. Obviously it's turned into something amazing, but holy cow, just realizing now the journey that you've been on, it's a little scary. I'm really glad it worked out for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot scary. It's a lot scary. And I think about the one time where Jeff is sitting in his house trying to decide, am I going to drive those four hours to have a two hour dinner with somebody I don't even know? Uh, and then to drive four hours home in the middle of the night? Should I do that? Is that worth it? Is this crazy? Um, it, it's just remarkable. It's remarkable. And truthfully, we are people of faith. Jeff and I do share the same faith, which made it nice uh, so we could talk about this. But he uh, really felt led to to do that. And, um, and I really trusted that prompting as well. And I just feel like it's been a, a God-inspired process from the beginning. And yeah, it's very but well, rewarding. Jeff, congratulations again. That is fantastic. Thank you. We're all very excited. Thank Christian, you. award-winning first time filmmaker. Thank you. Excited for you. Uh that's the last time I'm gonna say award winning until you win your next award, by the way. So <laughs> yeah. I'm glad you said win or until right. right. It could be next week. So you could be saying it every week. So anything else our listeners need to know, Christian, before we sign off? Yeah, I want to let you know what's coming up next week. I'm actually starting to plan these uh, podcasts out in advance. So next week, um, we have a new listener who started listening to our podcast because she was a first-time documentary filmmaker. And she was searching around for a, a podcast to listen to. A friend, actually, uh, one of the people on our team suggested she listened to ours. She and her uh, partner have been binge listening and have uh, want to kind of come on and share what they've learned. So her name is Elise Jaffe and she'll be with us next week. So oh. that's exciting. And please uh, continue to follow along our social media, invite your friends to like our pages. We're now over 10,000 followers on Facebook. Wow. That's super exciting. Woohoo. We need that many on Instagram and Twitter. That would be great. And uh, we're going to uh, unveil a new logo in our shop. 
So we've got a new little logo and we're going to put it on some t-shirts and things like that. So there's some new stuff. And if you can make a donation, please do. I have some bills coming up that we uh, really haven't had any donations and I could really use some help. So uh, that would be awesome if you could do that. So thanks for listening. And Josh, thank you so much. Jason, thank you guys for being here. And thank you for listening to Documentary First, where we believe everyone has a story to tell and you can be the one to tell it. Yes, you can. Bye, everybody.